My name is Larry Haviger, and I'm the executive editor of Traveler's Tales, a publishing company that started publishing books uh, 22 years ago in San Francisco. And I get the great honor and privilege of introducing the speakers tonight. Jeff Greenwald will be interviewing Don George, and Don will be talking about <coughs> his new book, The Way of Wanderlust. And this book is uh, only available here at Book Passage for the next uh, two or three weeks. After that, you'll be able to get it in any good bookstore on the country. Uh, the the ebook is available as well. But we have an advance uh, shipment here at Book Passage, and I recommend that you get it tonight and get Don to sign it for you. The book represents 40 years of lovable, amazing, inspiring, transformative storytelling that Don has been doing for <coughs> numerous publications. He started with freelance writing. He then moved into the travel editorship of the San Francisco Examiner and Chronicle. He moved on to Lonely Planet Publications. He moved on to uh, Salon.com. He moved on to the BBC. He's done many, many, many different things. And you all know Don because Don is the, the main man of this conference and you've seen him up here all the time and you've, you've heard him speak. But Don is a true treasure of our community. He's a treasure in the travel writing world. Uh, he has been called a legendary travel writer. He has been called the most prominent travel writer of our time. He's had <laughs> lots of compliments, obviously, and Don is an amazing guy. He's a dear friend of mine and I would say he probably is a dear friend of many, many of you. Uh, you can't know Don without loving Don. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Greenwald. <laughs> Don, gives, Don gives good love too. You can see that right now. <laughs> Jeff Greenwald is a, a Fabulous writer. I have known him uh, almost as long as Don, maybe actually about the same amount of time, about 25, 30 years we've known each other. And um, one reason I'm up here today is in, in introducing these guys. I happen to be fortunate enough to be part of the publishing company that published Don's book, The Way of Wanderlust. And uh, last year, we published Shopping for Buddhists, Jeff Greenwald's wonderful story about his time in Nepal back in the 19, early 1980s, uh, maybe late 1970s. And it was the 25th anniversary edition. Uh, the book came out, obviously, 26 years ago now. We published the 25th anniversary edition last year. And we were really thrilled to bring it back into print. And uh, we have that here tonight as well. Um, I feel really honored to be able to introduce these two. Jeff is also a uh, extraordinary performance artist and if you've never seen his performance strange travel suggestions I recommend that you find out when it will be happening again and make sure you get to see it because Jeff is a really rare talent on stage so with that I'd like to welcome Jeff Greenwald and Don George and thank you for coming tonight and they're going to have a wonderful conversation about the way of wanderlust It's an honor to be here, obviously. I'm going to take my coat off right now. <laughs> I just wanted to give everyone a look at the seersucker, but now it's coming right off. I know the original schedule said that uh, Andrew McCarthy was going to be here and Don George. I was really looking forward to that. Imagine my disappointment when I realized who was going to actually be. <laughs> Should I start? I don't know. No, no, I'm no. interviewing you. I guess. Oh I no! Well, thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many people. It's a great conference this year. So, Don, we met 30 years ago. And uh, you were the editor at California Living at that time. I yeah. walked in for a crazy idea about a story about the face on Mars. And um, you steered me in the right direction. We've been working together ever since. And now your first book has come out. So my um, first question is, what took you so long? <laughs> uh. <clears throat> 
<laughs> well, let's see. Um, so I actually have had the idea for this book for about 30 years. <laughs> I work slowly, but you know. Um, when I was the travel editor at the Examiner and Chronicle, at, actually I left at being travel editor at the Examiner and Chronicle. At that time I really wanted to produce a book like this, a collection of you know, the best of me at that time. And I approached people at the Examiner and Chronicle, which I had just left, and said I would like to do that, and they said, no way are you going to do that, because I had left them not on unamicable terms, but they didn't want me to leave, and I had left, so they weren't thrilled about that. So that was the first, that was actually when I thought, I originally thought about this book, and then it just kind of germinated and germinated and germinated, and I kept thinking, I'll, I, I don't know when I'll get around to it, I would love to do it, but I'm not sure when I'll ever get around to it. So it was, uh, it was really only about three years ago that I began to get serious again about doing it. So um, it did take a long time. The seed had to, ripeness is all, I feel, is the, theme of, is is the theme of the conference this year. <laughs> and it just took a long time for this book to ripen. There's something alchemical about it too. I mean, I think that the book, uh, uh, maybe it could have happened, but it seems that part of the reason it happened is because of your partnership with wonderful Candace Rose Verdon, who, who also provides the beautiful illustrations Absolutely. Yeah. the book. Well, that was the catalyst three years ago, Candace. Candace. <laughs> 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 uh, literally right here, right here, three years ago, almost exactly three years ago, perhaps exactly three years ago, mm -hmm. Candace was here for the first time as a student, and we were having a conversation out on the piazza. <laughs> And essentially she said something along the lines of, so was there any sort of project you have in mind that you would really like to do? Anything that's still left for you that you want to accomplish that you haven't been able to accomplish? And I said, well, I really would like to do a collection of like the best of Don George. <laughs> and she said, and what's holding you back? And I said, oh, well, there's permissions and there's all these emails that have to be written and I'd have to look over all of my articles and it just seems like an impossible task. And she essentially said, well, let's just make that happen. <laughs> and um, pretty much, she sort of helped me very much decide what were the essential stories that needed to be considered and, and what were the sort of categories into which those stories fell. And she very patiently, persistently, proddingly kept me on course. Just sort of saying, do it. Why don't sit over there and Candace <laughs> <laughs> talk more about the book than I, than I well, While we're here, I want to give Candace a shout out. I also want to shout out two other people, as you know, I've known Don for many years. I just want to greet Kaniko, Don's wife, and, and uh, Don's son, Jeremy. Yeah, all right. Here. the other day about things, uh, obscure facts about faculty members that uh, people didn't know. So I want to share three facts with you about Don George that you might not know. <laughs> first of all, he had his first um, bit part in a Japanese samurai movie at age 24. <laughs> <laughs> I did on that. Second it's of all, Bushido Blade, just in case you want to <laughs> Netflix, Netflix. Netflix. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> He looks exactly the same. <laughs> Really weird things. Don George has never taken a painkiller. Oh. Oh. <laughs> 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 and Jimmy Carter right off the wall. <laughs> and he has never bought or owned a pair of sunglasses. Wow. Oh. I told you they were weird facts. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Don, was there something getting back to the, sort of the beginning of your career? Was there a <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> she said, where's Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> was there a, um, a moment, a movie you saw, a book you read when you were when you were younger that sort of inspired you to to take up travel writing and really moved you in that direction towards towards travel and towards towards the life you lead now? Was there a movie you saw or something? Um. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to think what was the, the initial, 
What was the thing that I mentioned to you before? Give me my answer to that question. Say what? What? That was good. <laughs> yeah. The, um, it's, lucky, it's lucky we can edit this tape, right? When I was about five or six years old, um, my family decided to take me on a, a trip across country, on a train trip across country, I guess to introduce me to the, the grandeur of the United States and how big and wide and wonderful it was. And um, we got to California and we went down to Disneyland. <coughs> Disneyland. Um, the promised land. And um, it was wonderful, but the thing I will never ever forget, the most amazing, riveting, in some ways really life-changing ride for me was the Peter Pan ride in Fantasyland. And I'll never forget, I, this is probably one of my most distinct early, early memories, was being in these little tiny Peter Pan-y things that you got in, these little <laughs> flying vehicles that you got in, and it was all dark, and you, you take up, you're flying, you actually literally fly in the Peter Pan exhibit, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. literally. You literally fly. <laughs> and um, and you're, you're, because, you know, Peter Pan flew, right? We all know that. So you're flying like Peter Pan, and you're going over, and suddenly the landscape appears below. And I remember, I really vividly remember, looking out the side of the saucer that we were in, and looking down, and there were little tiny houses down there, little tiny villages down there, and there were lights on in the houses. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, oh my god, that's crazy. There's people down there living. <laughs> and I'm way up here looking down on them. That is so amazing. That was my first plane trip. <laughs> and uh, it just infused me with this sense of wonder, I think, about travel. Mm -hmm. That this is what can happen when you travel. The world becomes kind of magical and transformed. And I, I'll never forget that sense of looking down on those little tiny lit houses. And now, um, whenever I go anywhere, the most magical time of day for me is dusk, when lights <coughs> begin to come on in houses. And there's that kind of that, that penumbra between bright daylight and darkness. There's that one sort of moment when everything's a little fuzzy and lights are coming on and the world is in a moment of transition. And I just love that moment and it goes right back to looking down, I think, and seeing those lights. That was my first real travel experience. Hmm. It's a small world after all. <laughs> <laughs> Don, in all seriousness, you've written a beautiful book, and it's your first book of that's, that's just your work. You've been so generous to so many of us writers out there, and you've published so many anthologies that include so many people in this room. And now you have your own book, and it's full of stories that, that really reflect your extraordinary love and compassion of humanity and of the world we live in. And you know, the Dalai Lama uh, is famous for having said once, uh, "My religion is kindness." And you mentioned in the early part of your book that, that travel is sort of a religion for you. Mm. And what, what similarities do you see between like this practice of a religion and the, the art of travel as you experience it? Yeah, I, 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 I began calling myself a travel evangelist at some point. Um, because I really do feel like travel is my religion. And um, I think that travel improves us. Travel broadens us, it widens us, it enhances us, it enriches us. Travel teaches us about all the differences in the world, the incredible rich diversity of the planet. Um, it teaches us to respect that diversity. It teaches us to believe that people are good because I found in all my years of traveling that people are essentially kind and, and care about each other and generally people are compassionate and they'll help you out when you're in trouble. And I try to test this theory by getting into trouble on every trip that I take. <laughs> so far it's always worked out. So I, I think that people are kind and care for each other and that, I, and that whatever their religious background, whatever their financial background, I mean, generally people across the globe are compassionate about each other, generally speaking. And that's, that's huge. And for me, what happens when you travel is you build these bridges of connection over and over and over again. 
and those bridges make the planet a smaller place. And eventually, I think travel, travelers build these bridges, they're actually creating these sort of pathways to peace. I really, really feel like if there's going to be peace in the planet, it's going to be because more and more and more of us travel and interact with each other and encounter each other and understand each other's values and backgrounds and beliefs, and we get to know each other as people, not as you know, puppets that we're being told about by, by governments that basically want to stay in power. We, we meet people on a people-to-people -people basis. I really, really believe that's what's going to cause peace in the world, create peace in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've known you a long time, but there's something you mentioned in the introduction to your book that I, I wasn't aware of. You, you talk about how influenced you were by a Protestant pastor yeah. when you were growing up, and um, since you mentioned it in the book, I figured it's fair game to yeah. bring it up here. Yeah. What, what, who was that pastor, and what, what, how did they influence you and, and help you become who you are today? So I grew up in a small Connecticut town, maybe population 10,000, called Middlebury, mm -hmm. in sort of south, uh, south central Connecticut. And um, my parents were Protestant, were Protestant, Congregationalists. And um, they went to church, my dad sang in the choir, my mom was the head of the, the what do they call Sunday school. And um, so I went to church with them. And when I was a teenager, a new pastor came to town, a guy named Charlie Lucky. <laughs> Lucky child. Uh, and he was just an amazing, amazingly enlightened man who didn't preach so much of any kind of hardline Christianity, but he was basically saying that, that God is love, Jesus is love, really it's all about love. It's really all about love. And that's what the heart of Christianity is. It's love your neighbor, um, take care of each other, love the planet. And that, that message resonated with me hugely. Just really on some incredibly fundamental level, I thought that makes a lot of sense to me. The whole thing about a god and you know up in the clouds and that didn't make so much sense. But the notion of love as being the center of a religion that made a lot of sense to me. So he had a huge influence on me. I was the the head of the Pilgrim Fellowship, which was like the kids, the youth group. I worked in that capacity. I worked super closely with him to plan his annual summer conferences that we would have. Summer camp, book passage, just like that. Um, I never even realized that till right now. But So we had these summer camps that I would plan with him and we would run them. And um, I got to know him really, really, really well. And he was an incredibly kind, compassionate, amazing human being who got a degenerative disease and ended up dying when I was in college. I was gonna ask if he was still alive. Yeah, the same no, yeah. yeah. But so, so does travel, it's, it's one, one thing that really emerges in, in all of your stories is that you sort of enter them, there's a sort of faith. I mean, I don't mean a religious faith. I mean, there's, a, there's an overarching faith in humanity yeah. that seems to pervade the stories. So has travel given you faith in, in humanity? Or totally. Do you, and you can maintain that despite everything going on in the world right now? Yes, absolutely. We're so different. <laughs> <laughs> No, we're not. <laughs> um, yes, because, I mean, it's because of my individual experience. I mean, whatever you read in the headlines and whatever you see on TV and that the world is, you know, descending into chaos. Whenever I travel, whenever I meet people, all of my experiences have been, well, most of my experiences have been incredibly positive. And... <laughs> I just find that when I put my faith in a place and in a people, and I really do, I've learned to like land somewhere and say, okay, here I am, world, do with me what you will, basically. <laughs> people respond really, really well. And I find that if you, if you approach people with kindness and warmth and wonder in your heart, they respond with kindness and warmth and wonder. They take care of you, they give back to you whatever you give to them. So if you approach the world with good vibrations, the world sends good vibrations back to you a hundredfold. I really, really believe that. So just based on my own evidence that I'm gathering, I think the world is an incredibly great place full of friendly people who will take care of you and who have wonders to show you. And I figure that's my research. And I'm going to go with that. I, that's what I feel about the world.
I was really impressed with your story about Jordan because uh, you're not often very political in your stories, but Jordan was a story where you were entering a, a secular Muslim country and you had misgivings. It was at a time, I don't remember exactly what year it was, but it was a time when there was a lot of you know, conflict with the, with the uh, Muslim world. And you had misgivings and then you went there and of course, a, as happens to all of us when we travel to that part of the world, we find our expectations were, were overturned. Were there some other examples of places where you had preconceptions that you felt were really changed by your trips, other places that are represented in, in this wonderful book? Well, I want to talk about the Jordan one, actually, okay, because yeah. that was a year after September 11th, mm -hmm. and um, the whole planet was still freaked out, it seemed like. And, um, you know, CNN and all the, all the pundits were reporting, like, the word on the Arab street. You were always, they were always reporting what people were saying on the Arab street. And I got so tired of hearing people who I didn't know if I should trust or not telling me what the word on the Arab street was, that I finally decided I'm going to go to the Arab street and I'm going to hear the word myself. <laughs> I want to find out what, you know, I want to find out what the word on the Arab street is. So I arranged the trip and literally everybody, just about everybody I know said, that's a really bad idea, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. You really shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. You're just putting yourself in danger. And I, so for maybe the first time in my life, I was incredibly apprehensive about this trip. I thought, maybe I really am putting myself in danger. That's kind of dumb. But something in my heart was saying, just go. Just go. You know? What? Go. All right? Just go. So I went. And um, of course, people, you know, people treated me with incredible kindness and hospitality. They were so thrilled to see an American. I got invited into everybody's homes, I got invited into shops, they were all so anxious to find out what was going on in my country, as I was anxious to find out what was going on in theirs. And that was one of the first times I realized that as travel writers, we're not just, it's not a one-way street. We are, we're CNN for these people. We are also communicators of information about where we come from. They were looking to me to be the newspaper about what's going on in the United States. So they were asking me all kinds of questions, from what our rulers believe to what everyday life is like here. So I realized that not only was I gathering information to bring back to the US to report to people, I was bringing them crucial information that also helped to build that bridge of understanding between us. And I felt like that was an incredibly important role to play. And I'll never forget, one of the most heartbreaking stories was a guy in Mad Madaba, beautiful carpet shop. I walked by, stuck my head in, I sort of said, can I come in and look at your carpets? He said, of course, sir, of course, sir, come in, sit down. He spent about a half hour bringing out carpet after carpet after Howdy. carpet, showing me what, you know, these beautiful wares, and, and explaining the history and the provenance and how they were made. And finally I said, you're, you know, thank you, you're so incredibly kind, but I don't have any money. I'm a writer. I don't have any money. I'm, I'm not going to be able to buy any of these carpets. I'm so sorry you've gone out of your way, but I, I don't have any money. I'm sorry. And he looked at me and he said, Sir, you're my first customer in three weeks. Oh, dear. Oh. I am so happy wow. to be able to show you my carpets. Oh. I don't care if you buy a carpet or not. <laughs> have some more tea. Oh. It was so touching and heartbreaking at the same time. I like your stories like that one, Jordan, when you're afraid. Um, one of my other stories, uh, your other stories in the book that I like very much is the one where you climb Half Dome with your family, and I remember Jeremy sort of being a big force in that story, <laughs> kind of goading you. But it's, it's really wonderful to, to read about your, you know, experiencing real fear and terror. Uh-huh. You know, That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to overcome fear a lot in your travels? Are you mostly um, going to places because you, you're just interested in the culture? Or do you use travel as a way of overcoming fear? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's half dome fear, mm -hmm. which is literally, I'm going to die. <laughs> and I remember just thinking how incredibly stupid it was, you know, to die, to die climbing a mountain, that, why am I climbing this mountain if I don't need to? Um, but, because it's there, exactly. But, you know, when my, Jeremy was, I think, six or seven or eight, maybe eight years old at the time, my eight-year-old son is scampering up the face of Half Dome. Dad's down at the bottom going, hey, Jeremy, how, how is it up there? Um, I had to. I really did have to. Um, what what could I do? You, you had to do I had to do it, right? 
So I did it, and of course it was an incredibly exhilarating feeling to get to the top and overcome all those fears. And I absolutely knew, it's one of those situations where you know it's mental, mm -hmm. and you're saying to yourself, this is mental, okay? <laughs> get over it, it's mental. Yeah. And my mind was going, yeah, it's mental, and? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's I'm mental, and there. what? What do you want? <laughs> so um, I kept climbing because I just had to, and it was, you do don't overcome it, and the sort of kicker of that story is I was so excited when we got to the top. I was so thrilled and we'd made it. Yes, we've done it. We, as our family, we hugged. We, we had a chocolate bar celebration. We went back down and on the way back to camp, I was going, that was awesome. I'm so glad we got that over with. That is really, really great. And the last sentence is Jeremy's turning up to me and saying, hey, Dad, can we do this again next year? <laughs> we did it year after year after year. No kidding. For many, many, many wow. years. Wow. It became our, our 4th of July pilgrimage. Yeah, it was great. It was a wonderful family bonding experience. You speak of pilgrimages. I think one of the in really ingenious conceits of the book is that it's divided into three sections, which is uh, pilgrimages, encounters, and illuminations. Mm. Um, how, do you, how did you decide, like, I guess, Almost all of your stories have all three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so you, you manage to somehow tweeze them apart, and, and the you know, Yosemite one, the Half Dome, you saw as, as a pilgrimage. Right. And what, what is an example of a, of a trip where you had an illumination? Ah, well, the one that just comes immediately to mind is the, the last story in the book, which is the Cambodia story. Mm, yes, incredible story. Um, where I went to Cambodia, I, I'd always wanted to go to Angkor Wat, since a, a little kid, I saw a photo of Edgar Watt in the National Geographic, and it just implanted itself in my brain. I always wanted to go there. And I finally got the opportunity when I was invited to give some workshops and, and some lectures in uh, Australia and Singapore and last year, last fall. And I got to, well, I was planning the trip, and I looked at a map, and there was Singapore, and there was Siem Reap, and it's like, that's a really close journey. That's a few hours by plane. This is my chance to go see Angkor Wat. I, I got to do that. So I added some, some days to the trip and, and went to Angkor Wat, went to Siem Reap. But as I was planning the trip, I was looking online to get some information, and I found out how long it took to get to Siem Reap. And as I was doing research, I found out about this... Um, place called Bante Chamar, which is about three and a half hours north towards the Thai border from um, Siem Reap. And there was something there, there were no hotels there, but there was something called community-based tourism, which arranged homestays. <laughs> and, um, and there are apparently, according to the scant information I found online, there were some really amazing ruins there <laughs> that almost nobody knew about or were, hadn't been written about much, hadn't been visited much. So I thought, okay, I'll take, a, I'll take a day trip from Siem Reap and stay in, in Bante Chamar. Um, well, why don't I make it a night? So I, I thought, okay, I'll stay one night in Bante Chamar. And then I thought, that Bante Chamar place is kind of interesting. Maybe I'll spend two nights. <laughs> and then as the trip got closer, I thought, you know, that Bante Chamar, that's, there's something about that. It's like off the beaten track. It's, so I ended up spending three nights there. And the illumination was I got to Siem Reap. I got to see Angkor Wat. I toured Siem Reap, which it, those of you who have been there, you know it's incredible. There's these amazing ancient monuments that are mind-boggling. But there were also seven million tourists taking selfies everywhere I went. <laughs> and it kind of prevented me from getting into the spiritual heart of Siem Reap somehow. So I spent three days in Siem Reap, and then I went to Bante Chamar, And I had no idea what was going to happen there. And it was the rainy season, you know, the roads were all mucky, mucky, and it was impossible to get anywhere. And I had this wonderful, intrepid taxi driver who got me there. And I had a homestay. And the first, I'll never forget, the first day of the homestay, I got introduced to my, my parents. They didn't speak a word of English. They had a wailing child. Um, they had a stilt house on stilts. And my bedroom was on the second floor. And that's all I kind of knew. That was my bedroom. They didn't speak any English. I was going to be taking my meals at the office of the community-based tourism because they didn't have the facilities to cook for me. And I remember getting up to my bed. It was about 1, one in the afternoon. It was incredibly hot. It was 190 <laughs> degrees, I think. <laughs> Just that beating sun. And um, I lay down under the mosquito netting, and I thought, 
what in the world am I doing here? Why am I here? This is so crazy. There was no internet. I had no plan. I had no transportation. I didn't know what my food situation was. I didn't know where the bathroom was. I didn't even know if there was a bathroom. So I was really despairing. And then after the first day, it was kind of okay. The second day, I sort of got to know a few people. By the third day, I was walking down the little street and you know, the teenagers were giving me the thumbs up sign and the moms holding their babies were like waving at me and the guys drinking beers were like, hey, come have a beer with us. And I had become a part of the village suddenly. And, and by, so from the first day when I was like, get me out of here, to the third day I was writing in my journal, I don't want to leave this place. I love it here. And it was that was the illumination that, yeah, I had to overcome a lot of things in myself, but once I did, that's home. That had become a kind of a home for me. Hmm. By getting to know the people, by getting to explore the jungle ruins, by meeting these incredibly kind, hospitable people who'd suffered so, so, so much. You know the history of Cambodia. It's, sure, yeah. it's just heartbreaking. They were, the kids' eyes were full of wonder and hope, and they were, they were like Klieg lights, the kids' eyes. They were just bam, sparkling. And so, yeah. I was so moved and I learned so much about myself and about Cambodia and about the power of travel to transform. It's a beautiful story to end the book. Um, while we're talking about the power of travel to transform, you know that you've talked, we've sort of bookended the, the book a little bit, talking about the introduction and the last story. Y you've been at this a long time and you and I first met and started working together. There was no internet. I mean, that was something that developed and started about eight years after we began working together. Oh, How do you feel travel itself has changed for better and for worse, you know, in the years that you've been practicing craft? Um, well, I mean, uh, I don't, I don't like flying as much as I used to. Mm -hmm. Flying used to be sort of a grand adventure mm -hmm. way back when. Um, I actually think I remember, although I may be inventing this, but I think I remember that the first plane trip I ever took, my parents told me to put on a coat and tie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it was such a big deal. It was, this is huge, we're flying. You know, this is a dress up occasion. Um, now, of course, I don't put on a coat and tie. Um, <laughs> It's, so that's a, it's a more of a drag to fly, but that's so incredibly superficial. Otherwise, I think that in a lot of ways, the surface of travel has changed, but the heart of travel hasn't changed much at all. I think it's still all about overcoming your fears and opening yourself up to the world and seeing what the world has to offer you, and that that fundamentally hasn't changed. And people say that you know, the world is getting smaller and smaller, and with the internet you can see everything online, so why bother to go anywhere? And of course that's so patently you know, untrue. Um, there's always wonder in going everywhere, and you cannot see everything online. And um, that fundamental wonder of when you put yourself at risk out into the world and open yourself up to it, that hasn't changed at all for me. So I think that although you can say in lots of ways technolo technologically uh, the world has changed, the travel world has changed. I think the heart of the world hasn't changed much at all. Um, you've had many of the people here in this room under the microscope uh, squirming <laughs> under your gate while you gazed at the writing process. I want to put you in the spotlight a little bit. Uh, talk about your own writing process. Um, how do you feel about, how do you write? When, what time of day do you write? How much time of day do you spend on it? You know, how do you structure stories? Talk a little bit about your own process of writing some stories in this book. How do you turn your impressions on the road into a story? How does that work for you? I wrote a book about that. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'd like to recommend. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try to compress this answer. Um, I think that, uh, oh, yes. Someone in the back is holding it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so there's, to talk about the book, because the book represents, what is it, 38 years of my publishing life. When I was the travel editor, I had a column to write every Sunday. And when you have a column to write every Sunday, you learn to write really fast, and you just get it out. The, you know, the deadline is, is what makes you write. 
And so I got to write, I, I sort of developed an, a rhythm for writing a column. And um, what it forced me to do was focus. And I think focus is an incredibly important art, part of the writer's art. So rather than try to write a big sprawling piece, I would say, what's the essence of this story? What's the essence that I'm trying to get across? And I would focus really, really intensely on one encounter or one example, one anecdote. And I would blow that out to be a, a 750 word column. So those I wrote pretty quickly because it would be Wednesday and it would be due at 5 p.m. and I'd be, okay, I've got five hours to write this. So I'd just write them. But then later on, um, when I was writing stories for magazines, I basically developed this process of trying to figure out what, what the story was about, like what was the point of the story. And eventually I learned to ask myself, what did I learn? What did I learn in Cambodia? What was the overriding lesson that, that I wanted to write about? What did it teach me? The heart of the story. And then I asked myself, how did you learn that? What were the steps that the world followed to teach you that? Mm -hmm. And if I could break it down into the steps that I followed to get there, that pretty much was the roadmap for my story. I started with this, then this, then this, and that was what happened as a result of that. It still took a lot of breaking down into steps. So each anecdote has a step. Mm -hmm. What are the components of that particular experience that you need the reader to know to understand what you're talking about? So I broke it down into three steps, and then each step had its own steps. But that was the way I would started to construct the story. That's interesting. It, it, your book is sort of almost a history of travel writing in the way that it goes through it. And what's, what's interesting about what you're saying is that the very first story in the book, which you sold to Mademoiselle magazine in 1977, is your story about climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, yeah. and it's divided very li literally into day one, day two, day three, day four, day right. five. Right. It's very journal-like, and then as the book goes on, you sort of move into a more yeah. creative, fl free-flowing style of writing. Yeah, that's, so. that's absolutely true. And the, the Kilimanjaro story <laughs> was actually a story that I wrote as a graduate school writing assignment. Mm -hmm. I, I went to creative writing graduate, so I lived in Paris and Greece right out of college for a year. I lived in Paris for three months and Greece for nine months. Um, after I, when I was getting ready to leave Greece, I ended up deciding to go to creative writing graduate school in the US at Holland's College. And the summer between, I went to Africa and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro kind of on a whim. <laughs> Which you should all do, by the way. <laughs> Can you still climb? I highly recommend that. Could I still climb? Can it still be? Is it still? Oh sure. Oh so totally. It hasn't completely melted and become just screen. No, 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 it's not just screen. No, you can still do it. Good to know. Yeah. Um, so I climbed Kilimanjaro, and then I took a nonfiction writing workshop as part of my graduate school um, requirements, and the, the the assignment was to write a write a nonfiction piece. So I thought, well, I guess I'll write about climbing Kilimanjaro. So I wrote that piece about Kilimanjaro for my class, and then when I graduated, I didn't know what to do with my life still, so I applied for another fellowship because I could procrastinate. <laughs> Deciding what to do with my life was a great motivator to get fellowships. And so um, I got a fellowship, a, a Princeton in Asia fellowship to teach at International Christian University in Tokyo, which happens to be where I met Kuniko. So that really, really changed my life in all kinds of profound ways. Um, before I went to Japan, I thought cheekily enough that I would write to the editors of many magazines to tell them, to let them know that I was going to Japan and that I would be pleased to be their correspondent. <laughs> so I wrote to the New Yorker, Harper's, The Atlantic, and said, hey, I'm going to Japan and I'd be happy to write for you while I'm there. And they all wrote back essentially saying, we have, thank you very, very much, that's very kind of you, we have like 12 Pulitzer Prize winners. And so, <laughs> so probably we don't really need your services, but yeah, thanks. But some of them said, if you happen to be in New York before you go, we'd be happy to talk with you. Mm -hmm. And of course, since I lived in Connecticut, it was pretty easy to get to New York. So I basically wrote back saying, well, as it turns out, I'm going to be in New York from <laughs> August 1st to August 31st, so if you have any free time, I'd love to meet with you. And um, a bunch of people wrote back, even the New Yorker actually wrote back, amazingly enough. And, and I, one of the people who wrote back was the travel editor at Mademoiselle. I was a fervent reader of Mademoiselle. 
Seer <laughs> sucker, that's how I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but they actually, Mademoiselle had something back then called the um, summer editing competition, I think, mm -hmm. where undergraduates were encouraged to apply for a, a post that showed, I think, 10 undergraduates who edited an issue of the magazine for the summer. And I applied for that my junior year in college and did not quite make it. I got to the next to the last round. So I knew some editors at Mademoiselle from that competition, mm -hmm. which is why I had written to them. And they invited me in, and we had lunch, and I brought my Kilimanjaro story as a writing sample, mm -hmm. and I left it with the travel editor. And this was in the late 1970s. When I arrived in Tokyo to begin my fellowship, there was a telegram from Mademoiselle Magazine wow. that said, a hole opened up in our November issue, <laughs> and we put your Kilimanjaro story in it. Oh. Hope you don't mind. <laughs> That was my first published travel story. Huh. So, so wow. different than my experience. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, when I think about my career, I always remember that, that, that famous uh, cap caption from the Peanuts comic, mm -hmm. where Snoopy is singing his typewriter in the doghouse. He's reading a letter that says, thank, us for, thank you for not sending us anything recently that suits our needs. <laughs> Before we get to questions, you know, we all know you as this sunny, cheerful person with an unflagging disposition. Are there any places you've been to that you really don't like? Any places you really sort of hated and just don't have you know much good to say about? Um, the the worst travel experience I've ever had was in Calcutta. I wouldn't go so far as to say I don't like Calcutta, but I haven't been back. <laughs> and that was a long time ago. Um, so I was living in Japan, where, as you know, everything is incredibly pristine, and people have a really, really keen sense of like body language and space, and everything is sort of well ordered and regulated, and yeah. And you, I arrived in Calcutta, and it, you know, it was just like chaos personified, all over the place, jostling elbows, cardamom scented. Um, train compartments and it was just so sensually sensorily overwhelming yeah. plus I mean there were literally people just lying in the street and you had to walk over them and there were people approaching you you know you know money 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 and after incredibly um, constricted clean Tokyo that was just overwhelming to me I really kind of on some level freaked out a little bit in Calcutta. It was just too much for me. I couldn't take it. So, not that I you know, ran away screaming. I, I think we stayed there three days, I think, maybe. I don't remember exactly. Calcutta. Calcutta yeah. yeah, I think three days. Um, but it wasn't happy. It was not the happy time. Um, <laughs> that's problem. So that's my worst travel experience. I think. The other place was, was Jakarta back then. Really? I, I stayed in sort of a hellhole hostel. And actually, that was the name of it, it was the hellhole hostel. <laughs> <laughs> so in retrospect, I probably shouldn't have stayed there. It's <laughs> 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 just very far from the Peter Pan <laughs> 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 Where were the magic lights? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wasn't fun. Let's take about, we have about 15 minutes left. Are you ready to start asking questions? I'm ready to do anything. Sure. Question. Okay, there's, there's just one hands where I can't tell if they're waving to you or if they're questions. <laughs> I think it's a question. That's, uh, Aaron Byrne has a question back there, our uh, one time best story. When I have been most surprised, I get surprised on every trip. Hmm. But um, the thing that just immediately came to mind, which were I to have more time to think about it, might not be the answer I would give, but I don't know why. This just came into my mind was maybe because I was just there recently. Uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, where when I became the travel editor at the Examiner, I kind of rewarded myself by giving myself a trip to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tough negotiation. I came into my office, I said, so, 
<laughs> I'm new here, but I want to go to Paris. So, okay, that's okay. You just strike a tough deal, but okay. Um, so I sent myself to Paris, and I remember walking into Notre Dame Cathedral and just staring up at the incredible, you know, the stony symmetry and the amazing um, stained glass windows and feeling really just overwhelmed. Like, this was too much. I, I just kind of couldn't take it. I couldn't, on some level, it was overwhelming to me. Hmm. And as I was turning around to leave, there was a little basin attached to the wall that had water in it. Mm -hmm. and what do you call it? Holy water. Yeah, holy water, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there was a special name for the thing that contained the holy water. Yeah, holy water. Yeah, holy water. yeah the, whatever you all are saying. Yeah, the, that. So, he didn't do his research. So I saw, I didn't do my research. Right? So I saw the water, and there was actually a little sort of diagram about, you know, you take the water and you, you, you cross yeah. yourself. I, I'm a Protestant, so I didn't grow up crossing myself when I walked into church, but I resonated with that, and I put my hand in the water, and I crossed myself, and at that moment, somehow it all came into place for me. That very, very, very simple act of putting my hand in the water, crossing myself, somehow forged this sort of palpable sense of connection with all of the thousands, millions of people before me, through all of the centuries who had done that same thing. Mm -hmm. wow. And somehow, so I reduced that enormity of Notre Dame, which was overwhelming, to the very, very simple, palpable act of putting the water. And that somehow like compressed and, and focused everything. And I felt so overwhelmed. Tears just came mm -hmm. streaming down my cheeks. And I just felt this sense of communion with all of the people who'd come before me and had done that exact same gesture. And that shocked me, that that little hardly thought about action could do that, could have that effect. So that was a, a huge surprise that I ended up writing about. Before we get to the next question, let me ask you just a really quick question based on some of the comments from the audience there. Do you, do you generally do research before you go off on an assignment, or do you do it when you're on the ground there? Well, I'll tell you what I say in my travel writing book. <laughs> in my travel writing book, I say you should do some, some research before you go. You should have a skeletal idea of the story that you want to write, you know, a sense of why you're there and what you're going to follow up on, and know the essential sort of festivals and do's and don'ts and that sort of thing. In practice, I do try to do that, right. I don't do but often what happens <laughs> Often I'm on the airplanes going, wait, where am I going again? <laughs> and then I take out the book. If I'm lucky, I take out the Lonely Planet Guidebook or whatever and begin to read about the place I'm going to. So I don't really so much in practice. You, I shouldn't be saying this probably now. I shouldn't be saying this. <laughs> what I say in my book is really good. It's really, <laughs> really what you should do. But in fact, what I do is not so follow that advice. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. It's the grain of salt conversation. What, um, uh, okay, yes? Two, two questions. Um, approximately how many articles have you written in your travel writing career, and how did you narrow it down to this book? That's a really good question. Um, did everyone hear that in back? Yeah. How did you narrow all the hundreds of travel writing articles you've written in your career into this one book? Just 33 stories. So 35. 35. Okay. Um, I estimate that I've written between 500 and 700 articles in my life. Um, so that's pretty daunting, and that was where Candace was incredibly helpful. Um, what, what we ended up doing was a, lot, a, a number of stories just stood out because they were stories of personal engagement. Those were the stories I really, really that spoke to me, that resonated with me, that I wanted the book to be able, all about. I, I've written a ton of stories that might be you know, very small moments that were nice but, but not big enough to make it into the book, and I've written others that were more less engaged, <coughs> less engaged. And so there were maybe 50 stories that were really about engagement. And so I reread those and kind of whittled them down to stylistically what were the strongest ones and then 
because geographically there was there were more stories for say France and Japan especially because I I've lived both places I go back to both places I had a lot to say about both places over the years and I really only wanted two stories per country maximum so we decided on two stories for Japan and two for France and then just just pretty much pick the best stories based on sort of the degree of engagement and the writing and um, the lesson, I guess, that they imparted. And I'm pretty blown away that the book came together the way it did. Actually, literally a year before, Candace had created my website. And when we did the website, I felt that there should be some language besides just like Don George. There should, there should be some language under the banner. And, and I came up with pilgrimages, encounters, illuminations. And when we were putting the book together and trying to figure out do we order the stories chronologically, geographically, by theme, suddenly it just came to me pilgrimages, encounters, illuminations. And the stories actually fit into those three categories. It was like this seamless sort of life theme life bucket thing was happening. And um, so it, that really worked. So, and then we chose, there was one story that I'd written for Yoga Journal where my philosophy of travel sort of coalesced called um, Every Journey is a Pilgrimage. And we made that the prologue. And then there was a story I, I wrote after the, the death of a really wonderful friend of ours, Lynn Farron, an amazing travel writer, adventurer, great, great, great human being. And at her memorial service, after her mem memorial service, I wrote a, a, a sort of a tribute to her and a reflection on travel writing and the meaning of life, basically. And we made that the epilogue in the book. Mm -hmm. it works really, yeah, works very, very well. Yeah, you talk about pilgrimage, and uh, as some of you who've read some of my work now, I studied <coughs> Buddhism for quite a while, and there's this very simple explanation of what pilgrimage, pilgrimage is in the Buddhist tradition. And pilgrimage is a journey in which you give up preferences and expectations. And I think that that's uh, a lot of what we, we see in your, your book too, in these journeys where you go off trying to be free of any expectation or, pil or preference and just let the world happen to you. Mm. And that's the secret of, of pilgrimage. John huh. Pam, is that you with your hand up? Hi. Two things. One is, if it takes John George three years to write a book, I feel pretty good about what that might be. <laughs> 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 and Uh, do I ever go on vacation? Once, once. <laughs> um, no, not really, no. Once, once, Kuniko and I went on a vacation that I thought was a vacation, but I ended up writing a story from it. <laughs> I don't, and, and actually I don't mind that at all. I mean, I think that one of the things I love about being a travel writer is that it makes you a better liver, L-I-V-E-R, a person who lives. <laughs> For those of you like me whose livers have been damaged. <laughs> you know, I think when you, when you put on the travel writer hat, you sort of smell more keenly, taste more keenly, live more keenly. It's, uh, you just, you throw yourself into life more, and uh, I don't want to give that up. So if I, I guess if I were on vacation, maybe I would turn off that switch a little bit, and I don't want to turn off that switch. I love it. It's, it, it fuels and propels me. So no, I really don't take, <laughs> although recently I was on a trip where I decided to take like an hour nap. <laughs> and that, that felt like a vacation. I sort of said, okay, you're going to take a break here. You're going to disengage, and that felt good. Uh, with the lovely hat. Oh, thank you. Um, have you been influenced by other travel writers, uh, or did you come as a purely original? <laughs> <laughs> the question was if I've been influenced by other travel writers yeah, or not. As you started to write, did yes, you draw upon totally. other travel writers? Yeah. You just come as a no, totally. But, um, I began life as a student of literature, so my earliest literary influences were poets and then fiction writers. And I think that's colored a lot of my travel writing. I really wanted to be a poet when I was an undergraduate and 
was at a cocktail party, when people said, what do you want to do? I always said, I want to be a poet. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then I got to graduate school and realized how you know, hopeless that was. So, <laughs> but, so that's colored my writing. But when I began to read travel literature, the best, to my mind, I always say when people say, what's your favorite travel book, the all-time best travel book is The Snow Leopard by Peter Matheson. Mm -hmm. Just an amazing, extraordinary book, which changed my life, as I hope you know, great books do. Maybe The Way of Wanderlust will change someone's life, but I would be thrilled if that's the case. But I was in Tokyo at the end of a two-year fellowship. I had an incredibly cushy job. It was, I was living high, really, really high. I was teaching. I was the, I was the host of a national TV talk show on, wow. on Japan's national broadcasting network. I had a really great life. Mm -hmm. And um, my fellowship was ending, and the TV network wanted me to stay, and the university wanted me to stay, and I thought, wow, maybe I should do that. But then my college roommate actually sent me The Snow Leopard, mm -hmm. and I read it. The Snow Leopard, it, those of you who've read it, know it's all about taking risks, it's all about being true to yourself, it's just about the leaps of faith that we sometimes have to take in life. Mm -hmm. And I, in my gut, I was feeling that I really shouldn't stay in Japan right now. Hmm. I've done my duty here, I've done my tour of duty here, I've learned incredible things, I've met a person who will change my life, but it's time for me to go back to the States and get on with whatever I'm meant to get on with. So that book changed my life, and I think a great travel book can do that. And then the other people I love, is my great mentor is John McPhee. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. When I was at Princeton, he has a legendary, legendary class that he teaches at Princeton called the Literature of Fact. Mm -hmm. And the people who have graduated from that class and gone on to um, careers in journalism are almost like a who's who of, of great journalism. David Remnick at The New Yorker, Peter Heller, Peter Hessler, all kinds of amazing people have graduated from that class. I was there for his first class, the first uh -huh. class he ever offered. Uh -huh. And until that time, all of my role models were poets and fiction writers. Mm -hmm. So I sort of naturally thought, well, that's what I have to do too. And then John McPhee was there, a staff writer for The New Yorker, one of the most brilliant writers of our time, saying, you can be a nonfiction writer. And it resonated with me so, so, so deeply. It really changed my life. It totally changed my life to be to have an, that encounter with him. And he has a book called Coming Into the Country about Alaska. It's just a masterpiece of travel writing, or you know, writing, basically. So those two, and then Paul Theroux, I think is really great. He influenced me a lot. The Great Railway Bazaar definitely influenced me. Um, and then more recently, the great Tim Cahill, wherever he there, that, that man right there. He's the man. Um, I, I actually revere his writing. I, I learn a lot. From it, yeah, I learned a lot from it. So he would be one, and then Pico Iron too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, a couple more questions before we break for for, for the evening. Uh, yeah. Looking back from the wisdom of your years and some of your earlier stories, did you feel <laughs> the need to edit or rewrite them, um, or did you just leave them as they were? And if you did change them in any way, I'm curious, like what you learned from that. That's a terrific question. Um, so. What I decided, what you know, we we actually talked about that. And what I decided was that I pretty I wanted to leave the stories as they were. They were records of what I'd written in a time, and and the style was of that time, and I didn't want to rewrite that. There were very very few instances where I took things out that were, like when I was writing for the Examiner, I would make some sort of references to the Bay Area something or other that I took those out because they weren't. The only reason I put them in was because I was the travel editor, but they didn't really they didn't need to be there. Um, but otherwise, I kept the stories the way they were, but I wrote introductions to each story. So each story comes with an italic introduction that's anywhere from 100 to about 350 words that talks about what was going on in the world when I wrote the story, what was going on in my world when I wrote the story. And if you sort of read those, it's almost like an autobiography of sort of my life as a writer and, the, and what was happening in the world at the time too. And I really liked that solution. So within each of the three sections, the stories were arranged chronologically, and there's a little italic introduction at the beginning of each story to talk about what, what was going on. And that's all I did. 
one more question. Is that okay? And then we'll, we'll um, be quick for the evening. You, uh, how's everybody doing? I know it's super warm in here. Yeah. Are you guys yeah. okay? <laughs> so warm? See people fanning themselves. Let's take one more we, question. We have water buckets prepared. <laughs> 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 they're actually, yeah, they're actually um, holy water, but holy water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, take this one here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it seems like um, much of your, your travel, the, the success of your travel writing is making connections with people and I wonder if you go somewhere and you don't speak the, the language, um, whether being, whether, how much of, of an impediment is that if you go to Croatia or China and you happen not to speak the, the local language, how do you go about making personal co connections with, with people or do you have an, an interpreter, or how, how does all that work? Right, great question. Um, Can we repeat the question just about sure. how do you get by uh, if you don't speak the language of the country that you're reporting in? I do think it's a big impediment. I mean, I, I speak French and Japanese and yeah, kind of yeah. Greek, and um, <laughs> kind of Greek. <laughs> and I definitely can go into greater depth and have more encounters and adventures more easily in France and, sure. and Japan, probably in Greece a little bit too. But um, but it's not, it's an impediment and it's not an impediment because you just do what you have to do to overcome it. So occasionally that means hiring, no, nah, I never have to, I don't think I've ever hired an interpreter. Um, I just, you, you communicate, you human language, sign language, um, you do what you have to do to communicate to get your point across. And I've had some pretty amazing conversations with people without sharing a word in, in common. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that really has opened things up for me. So I think that that's, you just do what you have to do. And I, the, the alternative would be not going anywhere where I don't speak the language, and I'm not going to do that, so I just make it happen. Can I ask, I'll make one comment and one question. I traveled with you recently. I've had the luck of traveling with Don George to Italy, but I also went out to Point Reyes with you recently. And I left on with a class of about 16 travel writers. And when I returned four or five hours later, they were dispersed around. And there was a group of a young family from the Netherlands, children and other people, just complete strangers from all over the place under an olive tree with Don George. And I was like, <laughs> I was like wait a minute, a new flock in that amount of hours? So can you say something about the threshold of inhibition? Everywhere I've been with you, you cross it. How do you insert yourself in these, these situations, these conversations? How do you overcome that, that initial inhibition and put yourself there? Right. That's a great question because... Did people hear that question? No. How, how does Don overcome his initial inhibitions and feel at home anywhere in the world, basically? Even if point raise. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first thing that I need to say is that it isn't easy. And sometimes I think maybe people look at me because I smile a lot and, and think it's easy. Um, I mean, it's easy to smile. But, but overcoming those inhibitions isn't easy. But every time I do it, I get reinforced that that was a good thing because something good happens. And that empowers me to do it again, and that empowers me to do it again. And now, 40 years of travel later, I feel that I would be doing myself a horrible disservice if I didn't do that. It's still, an, it's still intimidating. There's still that sense of, well, I'm gonna make a fool of myself or whatever. But, but so, I mean, I've just learned over and over again that that's not gonna happen. So it's pretty easy to brush aside that momentary sense of I'm gonna make a, fool of myself because I know that the rewards of doing that are so incredibly huge. Something magical and serendipitous will happen if I do that. And I want that to happen. So I just keep doing it over and over. And it go kind of goes back to, I think if you approach people with respect and warmth and wonder, they, they come back to you with that. And they know, I mean, people, I think the vibration that I send out to people is that I'm a, I'm a nice guy, I'm not gonna hurt you, or I'm here because I'm interested in being here, I'm passionate about being here, I wanna know more about you and your country and your culture, I would love to have an interaction with you. It's pretty easy for people to respond to that saying, yeah, kinda like that interaction with you too. So I think that, but it is always a certain effort implied. I was just in France, I hadn't been in France in about 
I don't know, five or six years. My French was incredibly rusty. And yet I made myself speak French over and over and over hmm. again, knowing that I was opening myself up to ridicule and, you know, that's fine. <laughs> um, and, and knowing that I was doing that and yet persevering. And every once in a while there were people who were a little bit kind of like, what they would answer me in English, basically. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Je parle français, okay? <laughs> you speak to me in French, you know? Um, and I would just persevere with that. And, and I decided to think, think that they were actually being kind to me, that rather than being obnoxious and just speaking to me in French, they decided they would be kind to speak to me in English. But I would speak back to them in French. I wasn't going to give up on that. So that was really kind of fun. And uh, I, I just think you have to, you, you feel embarrassed and it's hard, but you just do it. And, and the world rewards you when you do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want to say one. Before we end, I just want to say one thing. Whatever, now whatever. it's a good time. I'll end it, but you can say Okay. So the one really huge thing, <laughs> this is where I start crying. The, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I won't say it. <laughs> right. I won't call you the John Boehner of Yeah, thanks <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so, so, it's so wrong at so many <laughs> 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 the, the thing I wanted to say before this wonderful evening ends, I think, is uh, one, just how much this means to me. Um, <coughs> this book is it's a it's a culmination of my career it's a sense of completion it's a sense of celebration of, of what I've done in my life professionally but not just professionally as a human being as a traveler it's kind of the I'm not sure I use it's kind of my Bible in a way I mean it's my autobiographical Bible in a way it's my if I'm a travel evangelist, this is my Bible. Um, it's what I've done in my life, professionally and personally. And the great revelation as I was putting it together was just how blessed I have been in my life by the kindness and, and support and enrichment of just so, so, so many people. It's been a profoundly moving for me to put the book together on that level. I mean, there's a ton of, there's actually a lot of people in this room to whom I owe a great debt of gratitude and, and thanks. And so many of you have touched my life and supported me in ways. <laughs> Book passage. Um, you know, it's, as I have said in the past, this has become my temple. And, uh, you're so intricately interwoven with my life at this point. It's a blessing for me to have you guys in my life. Um, you, you. <laughs> it's a blessing to have you in my life, Larry, wherever he is. Um, really, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't thank you enough. And Kuniko and Jeremy, I mean, I couldn't have done all the things I've done without you two. Thank you. Uh, you, you learn. I learned, I've learned, and Candace, this book would not exist without Candace, and her drawings are here by the way, her magnificent beautiful drawings are, are up here. Uh, Maureen Wheeler, you gave me the job of a lifetime at Lonely Planet, I'll never be able to repay that debt of gratitude. I mean, really, literally, so many of you have been a part of my journey, you are a part of my journey, you're like interwoven in the course of my life. And this, so I think of this book as a celebration of you, too. A celebration of me, a celebration of you. I'm so boundlessly blessed to have you in my life. And this book is a, an expression of that. And it's a way of saying thank you. Um, you have enriched my life beyond measure. And uh, I just feel, I can't express how grateful I am for that. I think that gratitude and wonder are I'm, I'm overflowing with that right now. This is such a momentous occasion for me. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. We all do that.
thank you all for coming. Again, Don is right. It's an extraordinarily wonderful book. If you can only buy one book at the Book Passage Travel Conference this year, Make It the Way Wanderlust by Don Moore. If you can buy two books. Yes. <laughs> up here. I, 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 I hope his wrist holds out. Thank you, Don. It has been an honor and a pleasure, and thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.